Welcome back to the Fourth Wing Podcast. In our last episode, I talked a little bit about the coronavirus and my frustrations with um, at least my my community's uh, my Christian community's response to that and the way that uh, it seemed to fall along political lines and falling along political lines because you know you can't give the other side credit you have to think everything is an attack and whatever everything just being so in line politically that we are unable to determine truth and sift through truth claims. Everything is agenda-oriented, and that's a problem. Today, I'm going to talk about a, a different sort of virus, but it, it really has you know the same root. And when I talk about it, it's going to seem a bit unrelated. Um, but I think at the end, when I when I wrap it up and try to tie everything together, I think you'll be able to see how I can kind of view both of these these things in the same vein. And before I get into this this particular episode, I do want to apologize. I think in the last episode, I maybe said some things or said things in a way that was maybe a little bit harsh, and, and I think part of that is because um, those things are still fresh, and I probably should have given myself a little bit of time to to really think through them and and to get my heart in the right place because um, over the past couple of years I've just felt very frustrated and betrayed by my Christian community and uh, and how they're acting differently than the way that I, I feel like they raised me to think and be. Um, and so, so the hypocrisy and just the, the blindness and, and all of that, things which I'm sure in my own life 30 years from now, my kids are going to grow up and say, man, dad's so hypocritical and blind in these areas. So I, I have not gotten to the point yet where where I'm having a gentle and gracious and loving attitude towards the individuals that I, I was critiquing. Um, I hope that in, in this case, because I've my experiences with this have been more extended and I've had more time to think through them and to sit on them and kind of get past the anger part. I'm, I'm really hopeful that I will be able to portray this in a way that is, is truly loving and seeking change from the community rather than, than simply being critical. So a little bit of, of background about me first that I think is, is going to help you understand the more uh, the extent of the frustrations that I've had and kind of the the experiences and, and challenges. So we, my family, uh, we are missionaries who are supported by donations. And a lot of people with a, with a job like ours really have a goal of, of keeping donors happy. And that looks like quite a lot of different things. You know, making sure that you don't say offensive things, making sure that you're nice to the right sorts of people, that you spend your time uh, on the donors and at the churches that that are going to be able to give you money and not going to the churches that can't give you money and all of that kind of stuff. That's that's generally how it plays out um, for, for a lot of us. And we've had to face that battle when we've had churches who say, hey, we can't give you any money, but we'd love to have you come. Now, do you do you still go to that small church, uh, even though that's um, gas miles and uh, time out of time that you could be at another church that might give you money? You know, this idea of stewardship and um, but if if your ministry is to to connect the church local to the church global, should you only really connect churches who have lots of money? There are all sorts of those um, moral consequentialist questions that that we had to deal with early on and so a lot of people uh, struggle with being people pleasers and I am at heart a people pleaser so I've probably struggled as much or more than than anybody else with that I want to historically I want to make people happy I don't want to offend people and so while I while I don't want to offend the poor congregation who can't afford us uh, or, or afford to uh, to support us at all, um, I also 
don't want to be a bad steward of my resources and I don't want to lose support and tell people, hey, we've got to stay here a couple extra months because we didn't raise enough support because we're going around to churches that uh, are, we're doing things that aren't getting us donations. Um, so then you make those people unhappy. So it, it's definitely a, a big struggle trying to balance those sorts of things and there are a lot of moral questions that go into it. Nevertheless, when you have a job that is provided for through donations, you can understand that that being a people pleaser and making sure that you don't offend people isn't just something that's like, I don't want the the tension, the, the social tension, but it's also like, that's how we provide for our family. So not, it, this has much bigger ramifications than just how people feel about me. Now, I'm sure you've heard plenty of stories of people who have gone for job interviews and stuff and uh, the the jobs will now start looking on social media and and seeing what people are posting so social media is a is a really big outlet that can get you in trouble um, at the same time social media is a a really important outlet to be able to communicate with people especially if your job is five thousand five thousand miles away from the people who are providing your income and helping to support your ministry Facebook and social media are, are extremely important for us to communicate. Um, that becomes a little bit more of a challenge when uh, you have, you're not really a business, so we have, we have a Facebook group, or I'm sorry, we have uh, our Facebook page where we communicate to supporters, but where we also communicate with friends and, and share ideas with community. And our community is broad, includes atheists and democrats and republicans and christians and all sorts of things so needless to say we have atheist friends we're going to say some things uh, that are slanted in a christian way that are going to uh, they're not going to like and at the same time uh, we say some things that conservatives and some things that liberals aren't going to like and that's just kind of the way that it is in all of this though Knowing that not everybody is going to agree with everything that we post, um, we we still expect that there's going to be some sort of cordial nature. Uh, if people disagree with us, hopefully they'll be cordial and civilized about it. And at the same time, we're not going to post crazy things like crazy fake news or um, or conspiracy theories, which is one of the things that really frustrated me about my Christian community and uh, how they handled the coronavirus, posting those fake medical news and um, conspiracy theories and such. We're not going to lambast people and just uh, you know call people who are pro-abortion baby killers and all that kind of stuff. We're just, we're not going to do that. But we will post things that uh, might be uh, against the party that you like and say, hey, look, we need to really consider what's going on here. These have some real-world ramifications. So keeping all those things in mind, um, you could probably see where this is going, but it, w it was only a matter of time until one of those posts came back to, to bite us. Um, so uh, recently, we went to... Uh, we went out to lunch with somebody and we had a nice long conversation and th this this uh, person we absolutely love they've been extremely influential in our lives and still are uh, this individual still is very extremely influential um, more godly than than we are um, has more faith than we do uh, has done more for the kingdom than we have done. Um, I mean, this individual is is awesome. W was awesome and still still is. We respect them them very very much. Uh, and, and I want to say all of these things because I I am at the point where this is not at all about saying look at these people they're so bad. It's acknowledging that um, good people are also uh, sinners and have blind spots. 
and and like I said that this is going to be me in in 30 years with my kids when they're looking back I know that there there are going to be some critiques that they have for me and I hope that I'm at a point then that I can hear that out and and listen so anyway um this individual uh, we went out to lunch with uh, ended up speaking with us about something uh, two things that we we had posted on Facebook one of those things was calling out uh, President Trump for, I believe it was when he was encouraging a, a crowd who was chanting, send them back about two American citizens um, who were of, uh, I guess, I don't know, some minority backgrounds. I think they were Islamic or had some, I don't know, they looked like they were or they, whatever people thought, I have no idea. Um, but whatever the case... President Trump was was telling um, was was encouraging the crowd, who was chanting "send them back," and and we just said that's not something that anybody should do, but let alone the president of the United States, who's supposed to lead people and sets the tone, and can influence whether there are racist outbursts, uh, e- even if he's not directly responsible for them, if he doesn't discourage those sorts of things, right? We can see peaks in violence. So that's not a good thing. We called him out for it. Um, The second thing was uh, posted after we had watched the documentary The 13th, which is about how prisoners are legally used as slaves. The 13th Amendment says that we can still have slaves. It's just only prisoners who, who can be legal slaves. And we posted that in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, we just said, hey, look, we've kind of not been on board. We've just kind of been silent about this. But after we've looked into it more, we want to just show our solidarity for the Black Lives Matter movement. So the individual with whom we were at lunch um, talked to us about about some things. And what I want to do is I want to go through that conversation a little bit. And I want to use the things that were said to, first of all, defend ourselves. Not, not in the sense that you know I have to be right and, and I want to defend uh, my reputation, but to defend myself or ourselves uh, in the sense that I, I think the things that we posted highlight some... Um, some very important things. And so I want to defend those those posts, and I want to defend those ideas, not necessarily ourselves. Though obviously if I vindicate the ideas, then, then I, I think I'm vindicating ourselves. So the first thing that was, was said to us is that, look, we, we really should keep political posts to ourselves. Um, in fact, uh, this individual said that uh, the their pastor doesn't um, doesn't even engage in politics in sermons. Now you might think that that's a really good thing because in the United States we we say all the time, you know, we're not going to get into politics, and and that sounds like it's a a really good thing, but it's actually a pretty terrible thing in in some ways, because what what it's essentially boiled down to is that. Politics is the moral black hole in our churches, which is immune to criticism. So because the, the article we posted was about President Trump and because our supporters are by and large diehard Republicans, um, critiquing President Trump was considered political and therefore off-limits. Um, we can't we can't bring in moral discussion into our churches if it's in regard to politics. Now that's it might not be relativism exactly in in that they're they're saying that it's good, but it's it's basically a defense that says uh, moral truth cannot be discussed about this a, a particular topic. So it's really close to relativism. It doesn't justify like it, it wouldn't say, well, yeah, President Trump is legitimate in in doing what he did or saying what he said, but it, by making it off limits, it's essentially a- approval. It's saying it can't be critiqued, and that's a problem when when you have this whole sector that is off limits to moral criticism. 
Like that's that's dangerous. That's a big big problem. If there's anywhere where moral criticism should be the strongest, it should be from the pulpit as shepherds guide individuals um, away from moral pitfalls and towards morals and truth. The second issue I had with that that statement is that I knew it wasn't true because things like abortion and homosexuality, which Republicans view as extremely political issues, were talked about, and there were clear positions given on those things in, uh, in, in the churches, the types of churches that we were in. So wh- uh, what, what makes this even worse is that it's not that po- politics is really off limits. It's just that politics towards a certain party is off limits if it's critical of that party. Okay, you can talk about abortion because that's a Democrat thing, and I don't care if we critique Democrat politics. But if you critique um, the subtle or not so subtle racism or racial insensitivity of our current president, who's a Republican, we can't do that. That's party weakness, and and that's off limits because it's politics, and that's a big problem. That's that's a double standard right there. So then this individual went on and, and discussed something else. And they, um, they had said that after talking with some other people, um, they had talked with some people who, after reading our post, questioned whether one can be a Christian and support a group like Black Lives Matter. Now, I can't say this for sure, but I am... I would say with 99.9% certainty that the individual that we were talking to and the individual who thought that we couldn't be Christians and some other individuals who who posted uh, in reply to our support of Black Lives Matter and were against it, I can almost guarantee you that they, they know little to nothing about the Black Lives Matter movement, about the protests, about um, anything about it other than what their friends tell them and maybe some of the things that Fox News has aired about them. And we watch some of the Fox News things and um, on, on Black Lives Matter, and w- it, it was amazing because when we watched it and then we went and we found articles about it and we tried to compare the sources, whenever Fox News, and of course we, we obviously couldn't find every single Black Lives Matter article or a uh, thing on Fox. But when we compared it, Fox News spun the Black Lives Matter thing to um, to just be ridiculously inaccurate. So one example that I can vaguely remember is that there was one where it said that Black Lives Matter protesters had, uh, had like crashed a wedding or something. And it was, it ended up being like, um, one or two black uh, people with Black Lives Matter signs, and they were, I believe they were actually both white, which I don't know if that matters, but the, the article pointed that out. And they, I think they, they basically just like held up signs or something. Um, but whatever it was, it Fox made it sound like it was this this heckling, horrible sort of thing that went on, when in reality it was it, it was not that. Um, so anyway, that's that's the type of thing you see. You see uh, Fox News and, and conservative news skew things one way, and I'm sure liberal news can, can skew things the other way too. But regardless, the, the story that um, we we're being – that made people think that we're not Christians is, is not really the story. If anything, uh, even if you don't think it's way to the other end, it's at least somewhere more in the middle. But we did a lot of other research on Black Lives Matter. We went. Uh, one thing you can simply do is just go straight to their site, and their site. I mean, they are they're very clearly advocates of nonviolence. Um, we we were confident that m- it, at most of the protests, uh, if not all of them, it wasn't the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, not the organizers and the people who are really in the Black Lives Matter movement who did anything violent, but there were people who attached themselves to that or who who showed up and 
Um, you know, if you're a hooligan and you want to show up, you show up where there are lots of other people. So if there's Black Lives Matter rally, you can show up there, even if you're not really a part of that or if you don't really adhere to those things. And then you can throw rocks and stuff and your actions get attached to the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, that's, that's what they were trying to do with Martin Luther King Jr., with Gandhi. And they were always looking for, for uh, times when, when they had protests and stuff. If anybody did anything, uh, they would say, see, look, they're violent. It doesn't matter if, if almost all of the, the protesters were not violent or if uh, most of the protests they ever had, there's no violence that showed up. They just needed one instance to say, well, look, we're discrediting them because because of this one instance. I read uh, one instance of uh, Gandhi, uh, his protest to the, the salt mine, I think, and I mean they basically said, do not lift your arm to defend yourself, because if you do, people will construe it as, as you lifting your hand to hit somebody. So these people literally went, just walked straight towards the, these British soldiers who ended up beating them to death, some of them, uh, and they never lifted a hand, but we, by and large, we we don't have people who've who've trained for that sort of thing, and so, to, to have, a large crowd of people who are untrained get together and have nobody break rank from, uh, from what the desired goal and the desired um, method is, you can't you just can't expect that. And historically, we know that the FBI watched Martin Luther King Jr., even though he was he was nonviolent, and they assassinated um, a number of of black leaders and such. So it we just you can know by history that um, any any minority group that tries to do anything is going to have the news skewed against them. But the, peop- the, the individual who was talking to us, um, who was familiar with, with civil rights, um, lost that lesson in time. And what makes this even worse is that w- we get double standards on this. And I know the double standards work both ways, but uh, as, as Christians who, who value truth, I would hope that it doesn't matter what the other side does, but I would hope that we could sift through truth um, ourselves regardless. So what ends up happening is we get a double standard where you've got a place like Charlottesville, um, and, well, that's not President Trump's fault. That's not conservative, uh, it, it, the fault of conservatives. That's not, th- this is an isolated instance. Even though those people attach themselves to us, uh, they're not a part of us. Um, that th- It's just... There, there are double standards all over the place where where we say, well, don't attach us to that group. Um, Westboro Baptist Church, and lots of lots of times we see that we defend ourselves from a small subset attaching themselves to us and giving us a bad name. Yet, when we look at Black Lives Matter, um, w- we can't see that same thing. And it's it's just disingenuous. After after those two things, saying that um, you know we should avoid politics and that that Black Lives Matter isn't a good thing and and people are questioning our Christianity, uh, the individual that we were speaking with uh, said that look, it's it's not even worth it for us to post that kind of stuff anyway, even if we were right, because we're not going to change people's minds over the internet. And that, that might be true. You might not really change many minds, but our minds have been significantly changed over the Internet um, in, in lots and lots of cases I, I won't go into, but it's our, our minds have changed a lot. Black Lives Matter is just one of the, the things that was changed um, as we saw people that we respected and trusted uh, latching on to that and, and putting their name on that. I'm like, okay, so all the conservatives who haven't done any research at all are telling me that it's bad and but there are people that I trust and who I know have looked into things who weren't latched onto it but now have okay i'm i'm my mind is starting to be changed and let me look into that and the extreme irony of this is that we have so many churches and, and this individual even mentioned that 
hey, look, uh, out of all the missionaries I've supported, you guys communicate the best, the most. Um, we love what you're doing. Um, and then, and then, there are two posts that are made, and now all of a sudden, it's changing some people's minds about us. Two posts. One that's simply just saying, hey, the president needs to be careful what he's doing. It's not really great. And the other one that's saying, hey, we watched this documentary about how uh, there's social injustice against a minority group, and we support a group that wants to stop that injustice. Um, those two posts, despite all of our work and all of our relationship with, with churches and individuals, people's minds were changed by those two posts about us. So it's pretty clear that people's minds can change based on the internet. It seems very apparent to us because people's minds were changed about us. Which is sad that through discussion and, and facts and all kinds of things, people's minds can't be changed. But when something butts up against their presuppositions and political idolatry, well then that can change somebody's mind pretty quickly about you. But even if, if there was no possibility of changing somebody's mind, even if, if what we posted wasn't really about dialogue, but it was about showing people who we are, um, our ultimate goal isn't always about changing minds. Um, our goal is to take the log out of our community's eyes. And so if, if there are people who say, oh, we love the Criters, they do good work, and they communicate, and... Um, I like what they're doing. And then they see us questioning the Republican Party. Uh, that's going to create some dissonance for them, which in my mind is a good thing. Um, we want the, our community to take the logs out of our own eyes, their own eyes. Um, and so if our posts can, can help them to kind of come face to face with the logs that they have, that's a good thing in my book. And as insiders to that conservative group, uh, because we are, I still would consider myself conservative. I mean, I'm, I'm against abortion, which is a, a big uh, aspect of, of being a conservative evangelical. And actually, we're going to start the abortion series after, after this one. And hopefully, we'll be able to, to help individuals understand why that's, that's such a, an important issue. But as an insider, a conservative insider, it's harder to just dismiss us. My group calls Democrats, uh, Democrats and libtards and all kinds of things. They, they're just cruel. So they can't call me that. They can't dismiss me, at least not yet. They might be trying to push, push us that way and put some labels on us. But at the moment, they've got some dissonance that they have to deal with because I'm an insider. So our goal isn't necessarily to change minds, even though that's, that's great if minds are changed towards truth, if what we're saying is truth. Um, but our, our goal is also personal and communal integrity and accountability. So results, again, aren't, aren't ultimately the thing. Uh, while we want results, that's not why we do the right thing. That's not why we speak up. So in our discussion, the individual continued and, and talked about how we need to be wise and discerning in the news sources that we use because um, we were apparently latching on to just whatever we heard, kind of the, the trendy thing of the day. So their assumption was that we're kind of young and ignorant and easily misled, and we need to be careful. Now, I knew that we had been extremely thoughtful about everything which doesn't make us right, not at all. Um, but we had done quite a lot of research, and we had talked with a lot of people, not just white conservative evangelicals in our denomination, but other, other people uh, of, uh, who are minorities, who are Democrats, who are atheists, whatever, uh, went to other news sources beyond Fox, and we, we were pretty sure about our position. And, and even if we were wrong, we were at least well informed. And again, I knew through conversations and observations at, at the, these churches and with the, the individuals that we were talking to, I, I knew that by and large they were talking with a monochromatic, 
homogenous group of people watching Fox and just listening to people demonize the other side. There's no diversity uh, in, in their conversations. And, and that was very clear in, in a lot of the conversations that we had, the things that were said, um, you know, what was on TV if you, uh, I mean, we weren't at that many people's houses, but what was talked about in other people's news sources, we knew that we were more thoughtful than a lot of the people who were trying to dismiss us. And again, being thoughtful doesn't make you make you right, but um, being thoughtless often makes you wrong. So um, it, it was just kind of offensive to be told that we, Im, Im, to have it implied that we were naive and ignorant when when we had done more legwork than the people who were critiquing us. And we kept on talking, and uh, this individual. You know, recounted that that the president had done a lot of great things. Just look at the economy, um, to to kind of dismiss the our, our critique of of things he shouldn't have done. You know, as if as if the economy um, means that that it covers over immoralities or that it that it makes everything that the individual does moral. Republicans, conservative Christians, lambasted Clinton uh, like twenty years ago. When he was saying things like, it's the economy, stupid. You know, that that's all that matters to people. It's the economy. I can do whatever I want kind of thing is how that ended up being spun later. But now we were essentially, as conservative Christians who believe in truth and objective morality, we were saying, hey, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, he's doing lots of good things, so let's be careful about our criticism. That's That's a problem. And the individual went on and, and um, said, so, you know, the president has said things like, grab him by the private, and couldn't even say pussy, um, but said, uh, recognize, recognize that that thing that he said was, was so bad that he couldn't even repeat the word. But then he was like, well, you know, so the, the president said something like that, and then went on to, to talk about some of the good things that he had done and you know, the religious freedoms that, that we had protected by having him in there. And the irony with this was that when we had first arrived at Chick-fil-A for, for lunch and were making small talk, the individual bemoaned Chick-fil-A's kowtowing to pressure and, and having dropped reputable organizations like um, the Salvation Army. That was a, a point of frustration for this individual. And this this individual didn't recognize the irony of complaining that Chick-fil-A was no longer supporting great organizations, and as well as taking on some not-so-great ones, with this individual's encouragement to drop moral standards for a president and accept non-ideal and immoral ones. It was essentially the, the same sort of thing, a frustration with Chick-fil-A at, at lowering morals and not, not uh, upholding a standard, and then um, a defense of a president which lowered the moral standards and, and uh, accepted not-so-good ones. Then we went back into the, the race relation discussion, and uh, the individual talked about how r race relations today are much better than they've, they've ever been, and uh, Catalina and I are just too young to understand how much better things are. They recounted a story from the civil rights era where a group of blacks were not let into their church because they, uh, and this is what the individual said, because they were likely troublemakers. Now, this wasn't like a, a racist thing where he was saying um, all blacks are troublemakers. What he, he was saying is that during the time of the, the civil rights movement, um, that the reason that they had minorities showing up at church was not to go to church, but it was to kind of flaunt their blackness, I guess, to, to come to a church where there are all white people and have black people in there. And they didn't. That, that church did not let those people in. And the individual's comment then was, it's like, you know, looking back, maybe we should have let them in. Right? He's saying they were troublemakers, but you know, maybe we should have let them in anyway. And Catalina and I, I, I think, 
you know, we were already pretty, pretty flabbergasted, but at, at this point, our jaws were, were about to drop. Um, it, it was just, it, it was one of those things where even 40 years later, I guess more like 50 or 60 years later, um, that this, this wasn't like a, a repentant sort of thing like, oh man, we, we really screwed up. It was a, yeah, I mean, it happened, but no big deal. And so taking taking advice on race from an individual who who still seemed to have some blinders on and who I think is representative of of our community to a large extent, um, that's difficult to to take race advice uh, or advice on race relations from somebody who who I think still has blind spots and not not criticizing them for the blind spots, not saying, well, they're, they're so evil because they have those blind spots, but just recognizing that you can have really godly people and you can have really sincere people and you can have people who do great things for the kingdom who have some really significant blind spots. And that's, that's not only an encouragement to keep pressing on doing the right thing against pushback from whether it's an older generation or a majority majority group, whatever, but also... That's a, that's a kick in the pants to do some introspection fast and deep because if that individual can have such a big blind spot, then what about me? So the individual continued and, and just talks about how you know the, there were people who had black visitors brought into the church and you know they knew black people type of thing. Uh, it was just it was just very very off-putting. I'm sure some other things were said during this time, but but that's basically the gist of it. Now, in some senses, we were blindsided by all of this. Not because we didn't expect that something like this would happen eventually, that we'd be confronted about something we said, but more that it feels surreal to have it happen and to hear some of some of the specific things that were said, the things that just are sound so like 1960 because because they are they're they're from some somebody who grew up back then and i mean even those ideas right those individuals have kids and teach them and even though some of those things might go away there there are remnants um and in certain places maybe more rural places in particular or maybe down south more so i don't know the different regions have different um different tendencies too so yeah Anyway, the the specific things that we heard were just grating to us. Uh, the things went against every moral bone in my body, how I'd been raised to have integrity, to not compromise morally. And, and to hear it come from someone that we loved was, was hard. Um, and it, it was. It, I am a people pleaser, and it was, it was hard to feel like I had disappointed somebody. At the same time, if you listen to the uh, the Christianity Today thing that I did, or if you listen to the John Howard Yoder episode um, on the politics of Jesus, one of the first things I got from Yoder was um, this idea that if you're truly living out gospel, and if you're truly confronting the powers that be, and if you're truly focused on integrity and following Jesus then cross is something that is a natural consequence of that. It is something that is that is going to happen. Cross isn't you getting sick. That's not cross. That's just kind of happenstance or whatever you want to call it. Um, but you uh, reaping negative things in your life as a direct result of the stance that you're taking and the integrity that you have and the, the things that you're saying and the powers you're pushing back against, that's cross. And Yoder said that if we if we can learn some things from the Bible and from Jesus in particular, we know that cross tends to come from your own people. The prophets were killed by their own people. Uh, Jesus was killed by his own people. I mean, yes, through through Rome, but uh, you need to expect that your harshest critics are going to be the people who you're closest to. 
because those are the people who are going to feel like you are betraying them, like you're undermining uh, your group, their party. So I, I don't want, I don't, I don't feel good because I was being a contrarian or because I was causing trouble, but I think confrontation is vital. And Stanley Hauerwas talks about the importance of confrontation as well. You know, we were pushing buttons that we think needed to be pushed. Um, even though it was more like them allowing buttons to be pushed because we weren't really pursuing pushing anybody's buttons. It's just people decided that they were they wanted to have some buttons pushed, and so they came to our Facebook page, and rather than passing passing by it or just letting it go, they had their buttons pushed. Um, so I was thankful for the conversation in, in that sense. Um, and after the conversation, we told the individual that we were we were thankful um, and and genuinely we were because most people deal with conflict by not having it by ignoring it by putting it pushing it under the rug by you know just this individual wanted to drop support for us and never say why they could have done that so I, I, it was a very godly thing to to confront people in conflict and so we were very uh, appreciative of that but we said, look, we can't make any promises about what we'd post. We're not being rebellious, just honest that, um, look, this is we're, we're not going to deny what we think is integrity. And if you need to drop us, drop us. Um, but, but that's not going to be a motivation for us to stop posting things. We'll be thoughtful about it, prayerful about it, but we're not going to stop. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if you remember where we started on, on this, but as a refresher, I promised that I was going to link this story back to our COVID-19 episode. So here we go. Uh, the first way that this is, this is like the COVID um, instance is because we, we see in both that there are polarized politics. So here in the issue today, there's... Because Black Lives Matter was an organization associated with social justice and race and the left, it was inherently evil. Nobody knew anything about the organization. They just knew that they were cop killers. They must be, right? Um, in COVID-19, you saw the same sort of polarization. Uh, you had, you had uh, other countries, European countries, China, uh, European socialist countries, um, and then you had... Democrats. Uh, there were there was one or two uh, early Republican uh, Republicans who really talked about it too. But by and large, Democrats were were kind of coming out and and being louder sooner. Uh, so it must be a a party issue, and therefore, because it's a political issue, I can't think for myself. I need to uh, just fall in line. That's what I think people do with race. Not, uh, and social justice issues a lot, and that's what people did with COVID-19. The second way it's, it's similar is, you know, as with pandemics, conservative evangelicals have a history of recognizing social justice issues well after the fact. Slavery, civil rights, women's rights, and um, now I'd, I'd argue prisons and the justice system. Shane Claiborne has a, a really good uh, book called Executing Justice, uh, which is about the death penalty and just some of the injustice there. Uh, Catalina read the, the book Just Mercy. We saw the movie. We talked about it a lot. Um, but, I mean, I would, I would really recommend reading Just Mercy. And you just, you can see that, oh, and the movie The 13th, the documentary, but you can see that, that there is so much injustice. You can just look at statistics. There's so much injustice in the system. Um, but, evangelicals, because of us, um, the death penalty still exists in the United States. We're the ones pushing it. And we're the ones who, who by and large, are pretty heartless when it comes to prisoners. You know, throw, lock them up, throw away the key. We, we, are, we are perpetuating the injustice in the criminal justice system in the United States. Uh, conservative evangelicals have a huge part in that. And uh, if you remember my, my Facebook post from COVID-19, the ones I saved from my conservative evangelical friends um, and acquaintances, right now, we're starting to recognize, it's, what is it, 
March. I oh know it's April second that I'm post uh, that I'm creating this, and we are just starting to really recognize. Oh yeah, this this is gonna probably be bad. Um, of course, all those snarky posts have disappeared and probably been deleted, so there's no evidence of it. Um, but that's that's the way that conservative evangelicals seem to be. We seem to find truth after everybody else has already found it, and we can no longer avoid it. That seems to be the, the kind of running theme for us. Rather than being the purveyors of truth and the ones who are able to discern it, we're blinded by our idols, and currently our idol is political idolatry. And that's a problem. We saw it with the pandemic, and we see it with, uh, with racism, or whatever you want to call this, political idolatry, uh, in our posts here. Another problem conservative evangelicals have, probably in part because we're, we're homogenous, monochromatic, is that we are unable to listen to the voices of others. We can't hear blacks and minorities in part because there are very few of them in our group, uh, we can't listen to them. If most of them are saying, hey, Black Lives Matter is uh, is important, and it's, it's a movement that, by and large, we should get behind, even if you can't get behind every single aspect of them, why aren't we listening to our black friends about that? We should be listening to, to other voices. In regard to COVID-19, we're not going to listen to Europe. We're better than them. Right? Uh, it'll, I don't care what's happening in Italy. That's not us. We're stronger. We're bigger. We're more prepared. We're richer. We've got better medicine. Um, plus, it's it's fake anyway. We, we can't listen to, to them. We can't see what Singapore and South Korea uh, and Indonesia are doing and, and try to model them because they've, they've been able to hold things at bay. We've just got to kind of wait and see when it starts to happen to us and then we respond because we can't trust other people and that seems to be a I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a human thing uh, in, in some regards but it's especially an American thing and even more specifically a conservative evangelical American thing then there's the disregard for our broader internal community um, so even when we had uh, again, I think there was one Republican I, I read who was pretty early, um, early at speaking out against the the seriousness of COVID nineteen, uh, and then there were the medical community, the CDC, uh, the international medical community. Right, we we dismissed uh, people, even even American medical personnel. We dismissed people in the broader community because they weren't telling the narrative that we felt our community should be telling. Um, and, and so we were dismissive. We saw the same thing with, um, with the Christianity Today article on Trump and many evangelicals, which, which helps to feed this, this individual who had a talk with us and, and their ideas about um, defending the president at all costs. But uh, most evangelicals the 80% who voted for Trump can't hear the other 20%. When they hear anything, um, they need to be dismissive. It, it's almost like they, they try to shun you out of the group. You must not be one of us, and we can't have dialogue about it. Go back and listen to my Christianity Today discussion, and, and you'll kind of get more specifics on that. But um, it's just so disconcerting that our community doesn't listen to the broader community doesn't listen to everyone in it and and realize that there are problems we have to have blind allegiance head down bulldoze forward and then on this this issue of uh, race and politics right, we make ridiculous comparisons to the past and oversight of of deep ramifications in in society right? with the individual that talked to us was like well maybe we should have let those black people in when they came in the 1960s or Things are so much better now. I I don't really know that there's anything to be complaining about, right? That that's just that's blind to a big justice issue, and that is that is just not even a, a a fair comparison or a good comparison. That because the injustice was worse earlier, or it affected me more earlier, therefore the one that that's existent now, uh, it isn't shouldn't be considered, isn't isn't something that we really have to worry about that much. And we saw the same thing with COVID and the flu. 
right? The the comparisons that people made when it came out, when it was out for a week, and people were saying, "Hey, look, the flu's killed way more people." Well, of course, it's it's been around longer, it's more ubiquitous, and uh, whatever. You can go back and listen to the episode if you want more of that. But the, it's it's just so so uh, ridiculous these these comparisons. And so those are at least five ways that I see that this virus of racism and political idolatry, how those things are are very similar. Uh, my community treats those things in a similar manner to how we treat pandemic. Uh, we politicize it, we ignore it, we push it away, uh, and all of those good things. So at the heart of these two episodes, then, I, I think there are two things which fit into the theme of this podcast. The first is that consequentialism and, and the way that we judge by outcomes is everywhere. Right? We we see consequentialism rear its head all over the place. We were told to not post things because people might react a particular way, so uh, screw integrity and screw um, holding people accountable. Uh, it's not going to keep your supporters, and it's just something that pastors and missionaries shouldn't do. We, we don't touch it. It's a moral black hole, unless it's against our opposition. Um so consequentialism is, is just rampant. Right? The president is fine because the economy is good. The president's actions are unquestionable because it accomplishes my agenda. It, it helps protect religious freedom. Race issues aren't as bad as they used to be, so it's okay. Right? It, it actually would cause more trouble to acknowledge that we have race issues and to try to fix injustices. Think about all that that will cost and all of the... Uh, just the headaches that we'll have trying to implement those things um, and all of the social disunity, just it's not worth it. They're not as bad as they used to be, so let's let's just get over it. So consequentialism is, is, is a big aspect here. But another aspect which I think is often kind of at the heart of consequentialism or feeds it is our lack of diversity in politics and race, the church's lack of diversity, um, and our arrogance about our, our own viewpoint. And that causes us to place others below ourselves. We can't hear alternative views. We shut them down. We place our ideals above others, and we determine uh, what others can be sacrificed for. Those, those two things there that I just mentioned, those are, are two big aspects of how we can uh, approve of killing other people. right? We, we determine that their view doesn't fit in with ours, and that our ideal is more important. And at some point, the ideal becomes so big that we're able to sacrifice somebody for it. One of the first steps to direct and indirect violence is in defining people as other and in viewing them as below us or unworthy of our consideration and shutting down communication with them because how could we communicate with them if they're not like us? This has led to direct violence in the past towards slaves, heretics, etc., and it leads to indirect violence now in our response to COVID-19 and in the propping up of a criminal justice system that is that has uh, is filled with evil and systemic injustices. Hopefully, um, hopefully this has not been a rant, and hopefully it it has come across as gracious and loving. I do love my community, uh, which is why I think confrontation and, and discussion about our problems is important. Because um, when, you, when you love somebody, you want to try to resolve those things. I'm not leaving our Christian community, our conservative community. Um, I want to make it better. Because like I said, it's filled with some very godly people, people who are way more godly than I am. But there are also people like me who have blind spots that they can't see. And they can't see theirs, and I can try to help them with that. And I can't see mine, and hopefully they will be able to help me with that. So hopefully this has been, this has been productive and, uh, and loving and edifying. That's all for now. So peace, because I'm a pacifist, and I say it, I mean it.